So this is the third episode of the second season of the MediQ Masterclasses. And today we are going to discuss about the physiology of basal ganglia and its role in the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease and principles of management. As usual, we'll start with a few MCQ questions and get back to the same questions again to see if we understood the topic well. Today's uh, webinar is divided into two sections. In the first section, we discuss about the physiology of the basal ganglia and in the second part, the pathophysiology and the management of Parkinson's disease. So here we start. This is your first question. The primary motor cortex corresponds to which broadman's area? The next question. The labeled area corresponds to which part of the brain? Third question. So here you can see that a part of this MRI scan image is labeled. So which part is it referring to? The fourth question. Here again in the same image, I'm going to label a different part. So which part is this? The fifth question. Subthalamic nucleus is a component of which pathway of basal ganglia? The sixth question is which of the following is caused by degeneration of GABAergic neurons in basal ganglia? And the final question of the section one is the action of striatal cholinergic neurons is directly opposed by which neurons? Okay, so with these introductory questions, let us start discussing the functional anatomy and the physiology of the basal ganglia. When we talk about movement, uh, the movement is planned in the brain. It is executed by the muscles of the body and a long story of integration goes in between from the development of the idea of the movement to its planning and execution. So when you think about doing something, say for example, you are planning to make tea or you are planning to write something or you are planning to play football, then all these activities primarily would arise in some part of the brain. And then the brain by some more complex mechanism will execute the activity through the motor system of the body, that is the muscles uh, and the bones. Now the question is, uh, what happens in between from the development of the idea to the final culmination into the performance. So how does uh, 
the motor system integrate all these individual functions. Once we understand this whole concept of motor planning and execution, we will be able to understand the precise role of basal ganglia in it. So we'll be able to understand how basal ganglia plays a role in this whole planning and execution part. So let us start discussing that. Before we discuss the roles, let us familiarize with the parts of the brain from a functional point of view. In the brain, an important landmark is the central sulcus. And this central sulcus, if you see, the central sulcus divides the brain into two important parts. In front lies the frontal lobe and behind lies the uh, parietal lobe. What is also important is that the part that lies in front, that is the precentral gyrus, is the primary motor area and it carries it, all the neurons that are responsible for moving different parts of the body. By Broadman's serial numbering, this is area number four, which is the primary motor area. And this primary motor area in its function is helped by certain other areas known as the supplementary motor area and the pre-motor area. So the supplementary motor area and the pre-motor area also give feedback or input to the primary motor area for its proper functioning. A great deal of planning occurs in the prefrontal lobe. And when these plannings occur, they also feed into the primary motor area for its execution. Another very interesting part is that once you cross the central sulcus, you get the post-central gyrus. And the post-central gyrus contains the primary somatosensory area, that is areas 1, 2, and 3. And along with this, there is the somatic association area, very much like the motor association area, which constantly gives input to the sensory area. What is now very important here is that the sensory and the motor areas depend on each other. For example, without looking at the external world, you cannot plan how you should walk. Without hearing someone call you, you do not really turn your head to that person. So the sensory system is intimately related with the planning of the motor system. We have to get time to time feedback about the surface on which we are walking, about the angle we are making with the uh, gravitational field, about the kind of posture we are maintaining, about uh, the target that we are going to reach at, whether it's a cup of tea or it's a, a, a football. So the motor system and the sensory system always works hand in hand. And it is no wonder that 40% of the pyramidal tract fibers originate from the sensory cortex and not from the motor cortex. So this shows how intimately the motor and sensory systems are associated with each other and in reality they cannot actually be divided into two parts. They work together. So how do they work together? If we want to make a working plan of the body, then how does it really look like? In the body, in brain, there are four important areas involved in the entire planning process. So we have the prefrontal lobe or prefrontal area. We have the premotor area. We have the somatosensory area. And we have the supplementary motor area. All participating in the planning of movement of deciding what to do. And when that decision is somehow made, the decision feeds into the common motor part and the part which directs all the motor neurons is the primary motor cortex. So from here, all informations will ultimately come and join the primary motor area, that is area four. The primary motor area gives rise to the descending neurons. So from the primary motor area, the neurons will go down to the spinal cord 
end in the anterior horn cell and instruct the muscles or the motor neurons to execute the plan. So the plan has been made. Now the plan is going downwards towards the spinal cord. And once it reaches the spinal anterior horn cell, it will instruct the lower motor neurons, that is the neurons that innervate the muscles to execute the final activity. That is from here, the lower motor neurons will innervate the muscles and ultimately the movement will be possible. So the plan is apparently simple. We have the prefrontal, premotor, somatosensory and supplementary motor area planning the entire activity. Final planning is integrated into the primary motor area. The primary motor area through the upper motor neurons, which are the descending neurons, relay this information to the spinal anterior horn cell. And from the anterior horn cell, the lower motor neurons will ultimately carry forward this task and cause the muscle contraction. But then how does the brain know whether the right activity has been done? How does it correct a wrong activity or reinforce a right activity? That is done with the help of two important structures called the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. So we have two very important structures in our body. One is the basal ganglia, probably more accurately called the basal nuclei and the cerebellum. Now, this diagram is schematic. Basal ganglia and cerebellum both are present on both sides of the body. And to integrate or communicate these two organs with the primary motor area, we have a communicating area. And this relay area is a common relay area for motor and sensory functions. And that is the thalamus. So the thalamus helps in relaying this information between these two areas. So how does the motor area communicate with the basal ganglia and cerebellum? When the motor area is sending down the information or instruction of movement, a copy of that instruction also reaches the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. So one copy of the same instruction also reaches the cerebellum and the basal ganglia. The cerebellum and the basal ganglia remain prepared with this copy. Now, once the muscle contraction starts to happen, in our body, the sensory system can understand whether the contraction has happened in the desired way. With your eyes, you can see what you actually did. With your ears, you can hear what other people are talking about. Your muscles, your proprioceptors, your skin and joint will constantly give ideas about your position, your equilibrium. And with the help of the sensory system, therefore, you can understand how your performance is going on. So these muscle contractions ultimately cause stimulation of the sensory neurons. And these sensory neurons can belong to the proprioceptors, the pain receptors, the position and pressure receptors and also the special senses like vision and hearing. Once these neurons have been activated, they will carry the result of the movement back to the thalamus. We have said thalamus is a common point for both motor as well as sensory activity. So, the sensory neurons will relay this performance result to the thalamus.
Now, what is interesting here is that simultaneously, the thalamus and basal ganglia are also talking to each other. So, thalamus acts like a middleman. In a similar way, the thalamus and cerebellum are also talking to each other. So, now see what exactly is happening after the muscle contraction starts. When the mu whole muscle movement, whole motor activity has been planned, the copy of the plan goes to the spinal anterior horn cell, the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. The spinal anterior horn cells ultimately instruct the neurons to cause muscle contraction. So the muscle contracts. Basal ganglia and cerebellum are the monitoring parts. They are like the class monitors. So once the performance has been done, the sensory neurons give feedback to the thalamus. And the thalamus receives the copy of this previous instruction from the basal ganglia. And then with the help of thalamus and basal ganglia or thalamus and cerebellum, they compare the two information. That is, has the body done exactly what was intended to do? Or it has done something wrong? Then that information is fed into the motor area again. The motor area makes corrections if there is any. And then again a new information goes down and this cycle goes on and on. So this is known as the motor loop that occurs in the brain involving these fundamental areas. Is this diagram clear to everyone? Okay, so this is a simplified form of the same diagram. And let us annotate this diagram to understand the role of basal ganglia and other parts in this. So we can easily understand here that the descending tracts from the primary motor area are the upper motor neurons, which can be both pyramidal neurons and extra pyramidal neurons. The lower motor neurons ultimately cause execution of movement. The sensory input due to this movement is fed into the thalamus, which is in communication with basal ganglia, cerebellum and cortex. Basal ganglia and cerebellum are essentially comparators, so they compare the performance. And parallelly, basal ganglia also helps in planning and execution of the movement. Cerebellum additionally helps in coordination and a lesser amount in planning. And both of them play the role of a comparator. They compare the question paper with the answer script as if. The comparison is ultimately fed into the primary motor area. So thalamus gives the feedback or the report to the primary motor area. And with each feedback, a corrected response will again come down the upper motor neurons. And each time the correction is made, the movement becomes more and more refined. So now you understand the exact role of basal ganglia. The basal ganglia plans, executes, and most importantly compares the instruction with the performance and gives a time-to-time -time feedback to the primary motor area so that movements can be corrected and made more accurate. So I hope this is clear to everyone. So we can now proceed to the anatomy and the uh, individual part physiology of basal ganglia. Basal ganglia contains five important structures. So there are five interactive structures on each side of the brain, which together are known as basal ganglia. Gray matter collections inside the brain are known as nucleus and outside the brain are known as ganglia. So from that nomenclature point of view, actually, they should be called basal nuclei. This basal ganglia is a conventionally carried forward wrong nomenclature, but it is so popular that we still call it basal ganglia. The 
caudate nucleus and the putamen are together called striatum and the putamen and globus pallidus together look like a lens. So they are known as lenticular nucleus. Other than these three parts, we have the subthalamic nucleus and substantia niagara. The substantia niagara has a compact part and a network-like part. The compact part is pars compacta and the network-like part is pars reticulata. Let us see the structures in a diagram. So, we have the caudate nucleus in this coronal section of the brain. We have the putamen and the globus pallidus. This whole structure you can see looks like a cross section of a lens. That is why it is the lenticular nucleus. And the outer part is putamen, the inner part is globus pallidus. The globus pallidus is further divided into two parts, the internal part and the external part. The internal part is called globus pallidus interna and the external part is called globus pallidus externa. Then you have on the medial side the thalamus. So this is the thalamus. What is very interesting you see the motor fibers from the cortex that is the pyramidal and extrapyramidal tracts are mostly coming down from in between the basal ganglia complex. So it is coming down in such a way that if the basal ganglia wishes, it can communicate with it from all directions. And that is a very important anatomical localization for the monitoring function. Something that you want to monitor must go through and through you. And that is how monitoring becomes easy. So the thalamus, caudate nucleus and the lenticular nucleus in a way surround or encase the motor fibers and therefore nothing goes escaped. So every activity of the motor cortex will therefore be monitored by the descending fibers. These fibers which are compressed between the thalamus and the uh, lenticular nucleus, these are known as the internal capsule. So this compressed fiber bat is also known as internal capsule. So anatomically, medially you have the thalamus, laterally you have the lenticular nucleus, you have the caudate nucleus above and through and through this passes the internal capsule carrying the motor fibers. If we see this in a more realistic picture of a morbid specimen and the MRI scan, let me first point this out in the morbid specimen. So you can easily understand from this diagram that you have a dark area here, that is the gray matter. You have another dark area here. And you have a third dark area here. So can I get the answers in the chat box? So I'm labeling them one by one, you just name them. So what do you think is this area? Based on our diagram. Wonderful, so this is the thalamus. This is the thalamus. What do you think is the area on top? Wonderful, this is the caudate nucleus. And what is the area present laterally? That is the lenticular nucleus. The same anatomy can be better appreciated in the MRI scan of the brain and you can easily understand the locations. Uh, this is therefore the lenticular nucleus. This is the caudate nucleus and this must be the thalamus. And therefore the thick fiber that is passing through and through this must be the internal capsule. So the fiber that is passing through and through must be the internal capsule. 
one interesting finding that at least the beginners should notice is you see in the brain the gray matter looks white and the white matter looks gray can anyone tell me what is the reason behind this why are the color schemes changed in a ct scan or in a t1 weighted mri scan This is not a T2 weighted scan. In T2 weighted scan, the thing will be, yes, it is because of the presence of myelin. Very good. Myelin is fat. And radiologically, fat is more lucent. So radi radiation passes through it. As a result, wherever there is more fat, that will look black. And wherever there is more cytoplasm, that will look gray or black in color. So uh, you can see here, that the dark areas are the areas where axons are present, that is fat. And the light areas are areas where cytoplasm with ribosome, nucleus, etc. are present. So the gray area or the cell body area looks white, which in reality looks gray. And the myelin sheet area looks dark because of the fat, which in reality looks white in color. That is why in CT scan or in the T1 weighted MRI scan, the colors are actually flipped. So, understanding this basic idea of how basal ganglia complex looks like and how the motor fibers pass through and through them, let us now understand how the basal ganglia functions. So, what exactly does it do inside it to modulate and monitor the movement? At the onset, I must say that we know very little about basal ganglia. Relatively much more is known about the cerebellum, but the functioning of basal ganglia is very complex and new neurological models are evolving every day. So I'm presenting to you the most accepted view uh, of whatever we know about the basal ganglia. To start with, we have some important parts of the basal ganglia. So we have the striatum, that is the caudate nucleus and putamen. They are put together because their functions are similar. Then we have the globus pallidus, Interna and substantia uh, niagara pars reticulata. They are also grouped together because their functions are similar. And both striatum and GPI or SNR, also called SNPR, substantia niagara pars reticulata, they are inhibitory areas. We have two excitatory areas. One is thalamus, which is always excitatory, and subthalamic nucleus, which is also excitatory. So we introduce the cortex and the thalamus in this circuit. So cortex interacts with the striatum and the thalamus also interacts with the cortex. So a loop is formed. Now, how do we remember how to draw the circuit of the basal ganglia? So you first draw the important parts, striatum, GPI or SNPR, which are functionally similar. And on one side, you draw globus pallidus externa and subthalamic nucleus. Once these areas are drawn, you position cortex at the top and at the bottom. And just above the cortex, you place the thalamus. So your basic architecture of the basal ganglia complex is ready. Now you have to draw the connections. In the basal ganglia pathway, there are two neurological circuits that operate. One is a small circuit and so it is called the direct pathway. Another is a long circuit and therefore it is known as the indirect pathway. So how do you remember and draw the circuit? There are some general rules that will help you to draw the circuit. First you divide this into direct and indirect pathway. So the extra nuclei are part of the indirect pathway. So GPE, globus pallidus externa and subthalamic nucleus only appear in the indirect pathway. They do not get involved in the direct pathway because the direct pathway is very short. It doesn't go round about. The next step that you do is you try to draw the acetylcholine fibers. Acetylcholine does not connect two nucleus. It is present within the striatum. That is why the cholinergic fibers are called intrastriatal cholinergic fibers. So acetylcholine fibers are not connecting two nucleus. They are present within the striatum to regulate the function of striatum. 
Now you draw the external part of the circuit. Remember one thing that the cortex, the thalamus and the subthalamic nucleus. The cortex, the thalamus and the subthalamic nucleus is always excitatory in nature. So the cortex, the thalamus and the subthalamic nucleus always releases glutamate and it is excitatory in nature. So we will draw them connecting all the nearby structures. So cortex will always stimulate the striatum, thalamus will always stimulate the cortex and subthalamic nucleus will always stimulate the GPI or SNPR. Now remember all the other parts that is globus pallidus interna, globus pallidus externa and the striatum. All of them are inhibitory in nature. So let's draw all the inhibitory fibers. So GPI will inhibit anything that comes next to it. Striatum will inhibit anything that comes next to it in the pathway. And globus pallidus externa will also inhibit whatever comes next in its pathway. So I'm showing this once again. The striatum, the GPE and GPI are always inhibitory. They always inhibit what comes next. So we will now draw the inhibitory fibers and they all secrete GABA. So now the main skeleton of the indirect and direct pathway is done. We are now left with a very important part. The Niagrostriatal dopaminergic tract. The Niagara striatal, the name tells you, it starts in substantia Niagara and ends in striatum. That is why it is Niagara striatal. So the Niagara striatal tract has two kinds of dopaminergic fibers, stimulatory and inhibitory, based on the type of receptors. The stimulatory fibers connect to the direct pathway and the inhibitory fiber connects to the indirect pathway, like this. So, the dopaminergic fibers from substantia Niagara, they stimulate the direct pathway and they inhibit the indirect pathway. And this is the complete basal ganglia circuitry. So, can I expect that you will practice this twice or thrice and maybe you can draw the whole diagram yourself if you do it conceptually step by step. So, draw the nuclei, draw the intrastriatal cholinergic tract, then draw all the excitatory fibers, the cortex, the subthalamic nucleus and thalamus are always excitatory. Now draw the inhibitory fibers. All other nuclei are inhibitory. And in the last, draw the niagrostriatal dopaminergic fiber. It is stimulatory to the direct pathway and inhibitory to the indirect pathway. So up to this, is this clear? Okay. Now, this is only about the structure. We have to now analyze what function it does. We can see that this diagram in a way is telling us something. It's giving an idea that in the cortex, the idea of movement has originated. And that idea is see again going back to the cortex. So why is an idea coming out of the cortex and then going back to the cortex. What exactly is this loop doing? So, the cortex is now getting a revised idea of movement. So, it's always trying to make itself better. And who is revising this idea? All the structures in between. They are revising this idea and making it more and more accurate in every loop of the motor circuit. So, is it stimulating the previous idea or inhibiting the previous idea? Is it saying that the previous idea was good or is it saying that the previous idea was bad? How is that determined? So, let us understand this by understanding the function of the direct and indirect pathway. For some time, let us forget the role of substantia Niagara dopaminergic tract. Let us forget about the dopaminergic tracts. Let us only concentrate on the direct and the indirect pathway. Whether a pathway is stimulatory or inhibitory can be calculated in many ways. But the shortest way to do that 
particularly during examination, is a very simple algebraic method. So what you do simply is, you multiply the algebraic signs. You know that plus sign, when it is multiplied n number of times, whatever be the number of times you multiply it, always remains plus. Whereas minus sign, when multiplied for even number of times, becomes plus. When multiplied for odd number of times, becomes minus. That is the very basic idea we will use here to understand the function of the basal ganglia. Again, forget about what the dopaminergic neuron is doing. Let us first look at the direct pathway. So we are not bothered about the plus sign. We are mainly bothered about the minus sign because plus always remains plus. So in the direct pathway, let us see how many minus signs we have. From cortex to striatum, no minus sign. From striatum to GPI, there is one minus sign. From GPI to thalamus, there is one more minus sign. From thalamus to cortex, there is no minus sign. So tell me how many negative signs or inhibitions did we get in the direct pathway? So if I multiply these two inhibitory mechanisms, what will be the result? Stimulatory or inhibitory? Wonderful. So the result will be stimulated. So can we say therefore that ignoring the dopaminergic tract of course, the direct pathway stimulates the cortex. So is it okay to say that the direct pathway stimulates the cortex? Now let us go in a similar way about the indirect pathway. So in the indirect pathway between cortex to the striatum there is no negative sign. Between striatum to GPE you have one negative sign. Between GPE to subthalamic nucleus you have a second negative sign. Between subthalamic nucleus to GPI there is no negative sign. Between GPI and thalamus there is a third negative sign. And again from thalamus to cortex there is no negative sign. So altogether, how many negative signs did we get? Three. And now, if three levels of inhibition are multiplied together, then what will you end up in? Stimulation or inhibition? So we will be ending up in inhibition. So can we therefore say that the indirect pathway inhibits the cortex? The indirect pathway inhibits the cortex. Now this is a very important function because the indirect pathway therefore by its operation, the indirect pathway tries to inhibit the unwanted movements and that is how movement becomes more and more refined. This indirect pathway will stop all unwanted movements from happening. So whenever the unwanted movements happen, the indirect pathway is activated and it tries to stop all those unwanted movements. And this is one mechanism by which indirect pathway inhibits the unwanted movements and sends that information to the cortex. Now, when we are planning about doing something and we really want to do that, so we are motivated to do that, we have planned to do that, then that activity has to be done. So voluntary activity should be done and therefore when this voluntary activity has to be done during that time the substantia niagara fires. So substantia niagara fires on planning or motivation. Once the substantia niagara fires you see two opposite things are happening. It is stimulating the direct pathway and it is inhibiting the indirect pathway. It is stimulating the direct pathway and it is inhibiting the indirect pathway. Now let us see the net effect of this. The net effect will be 
you tell me what is the net effect of the direct pathway, stimulatory or inhibitory? It is stimulatory. So, stimulation is now multiplied by further stimulation and you end up in stimulation. What is the net effect of the indirect pathway? It is inhibition. Therefore, inhibition is the normal function of the indirect pathway. That is multiplied by the inhibitory dopaminergic tract that is further inhibition. So, what is the net effect? The net effect will be stimulation. So, what is interesting here is that although the direct and indirect pathway have their individual functions of stimulating a movement or inhibiting a movement. However, when the substantia Niagara dopaminergic neuron fires, this causes both pathways to turn into stimulatory pathway. And therefore, the movement that is intended to be done is ultimately done. So, I think this is clear to everyone. So then can we say that the nigrostriatal dopaminergic tract makes a movement possible? It accelerates a movement, it motivates us to work and it initiates any voluntary activity because both pathways under the influence of substantia niagara become stimulatory in nature. And this is the reason why if this dopaminergic pathway is destroyed, then this motivation is lost, this planning is lost and voluntary activities will take a long time to start and the speed of the voluntary activity will also become slow leading to bradykinesia. So I hope this is clear. So as I was saying, uh, most disorders of basal ganglia involve the indirect pathway, not the direct pathway. Again, if you ask me why, that's not quite clearly known. Because I told you in the beginning of this class that the basal ganglia is very less explored. We know very little about the basal ganglia. So most disorders that we will discuss today are disorders of the indirect pathway, not of the direct pathway. So in the indirect pathway, if this inhibition goes away, then the pathway remains inhibited. That slows down movement and therefore it causes the disorder called Parkinsonism. If the GABAergic tract is damaged, then the inhibitory nature of the tract becomes stimulatory because you see you are left with two minus signs that will become plus. So there is excess unwanted activity and this leads to a movement known as chorea. If the subthalamic nucleus is damaged, then the inhibitory action of sub GPE on subthalamic nucleus does not get transmitted. So there is a block before the inhibition and this might result in some abnormal movement known as hemibalismus. There are many other basal ganglia diseases but today we will focus mainly on Parkinsonism. So what are the functions of basal ganglia based on what we discussed? Number one is planning and execution of the voluntary movement. The time to time planning and correction of movement is a function of the basal ganglia. Subconscious movement, something that we do when, when we are not actively thinking. For example, um, while watching television, you can eat. Or for example, uh, someone can uh, knit something or sew something or draw something while talking to the other people. You can play a musical instrument without paying much attention if you are already trained in that. This kind of movements are subconscious movements. Attending to a phone call when you are driving. These subconscious movements are also regulated to some extent by the basal ganglia. Because procedural memory 
is stored in three parts of the brain. We have seen in the previous episodes also. The motor cortex, the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. Muscle tone is regulated by basal ganglia. Probably it reduces the muscle tone. That is why when the basal ganglia is damaged, you get rigidity. Basal ganglia helps in reflex activities. In basal ganglia disorders, the reflex actions may be abnormal and abrupt. Automatic associated movements, like for example, when you are walking, your opposite arm also swings. The swinging movement of the arm is an example of automatic associated movement. This arm swing is a function of the basal ganglia. So in the early stages of Parkinsonism, arm swing is reduced. The person moves like a statue without swinging the arms. And basal ganglia also has a role in sleep and arousal mechanism. So in basal ganglia disorders in the advanced stage, there is severe sleep disorder. So this in summary are the functions of the basal ganglia. So is this in a nutshell clear to everyone? Okay, so we can then try the questions that we started with. So let's answer this question together. Primary motor cortex corresponds to which broadband's area? Wonderful. It is area 4. Next question. The labeled area corresponds to which area? So if you look carefully into this diagram, you will see this is the central sulcus. Therefore, we are talking about the post-central gyrus. So this is the primary somatosensory area. This is the primary somatosensory area or P. And the red area is the motor area or the pre-central gyrus. And the green area is the sensory association area that is behind the somatosensory area. Next, what does the labeled area correspond to? It corresponds to the thalamus. Wonderful. So what does this labeled area correspond to? Wonderful, it corresponds to the internal capsule. Subthalamic nucleus is a component of which pathway? Very good, it's part of the indirect pathway of the basal ganglia. Which of the following is caused by degeneration of the GABAergic neurons? Very good. The answer is chorea. And finally, the action of the striatal cholinergic neuron is opposed by which neurons? Yes, the answer will be dopaminergic neurons. Uh, of course, the question has a catch in it. The dopaminergic neuron can both stimulate it and oppose it. So, opposing it is correct. However, the options A, C and D are totally incorrect because they are not related with the cholinergic neuron. And therefore, the answer will be B, the nigrostriatal dopaminergic neurons. So, we covered very briefly the physiology of the basal ganglion. 
Let us now discuss about Parkinsonism and its management. Let us start with a few questions again. So which of the following is best described as a dance-like movement? Next question. Which of the following is characterized by resting tremor and rigidity? Next question. Parkinson's disease can be Next question. Parkinson's disease is characterized by Next question. The drug not used to treat Parkinson's disease. Next question. What does Carbidopa reduce? Next question, on-off phenomenon can be treated by and the final question before we start discussion, neuroprotective therapy refers to So with this discussion, let us start uh, talking about the pathophysiology and management of Parkinsonism. There are different kinds of disorders that involve the basal ganglia. Because basal ganglia is a part outside the pyramidal tract, so the basal ganglia disorders are also known as extrapyramidal movement disorders. The common extrapyramidal movement disorders are Parkinsonism, chorea, hemibalismus, Tremor, which is also seen in Parkinsonism, and athetosis. So, this is a very simple summary of the extrapyramidal movement disorders. We have already seen the circuitry of the basal ganglia. So, Parkinsonism typically happens when there is deficiency of dopamine in the nigrostriatal pathway. So, nigrostriatal dopamine deficiency causes Parkinsonism. And it is characterized by the trap signs. Tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, and postural instability. The word chorea is the root word from which you get the word choreography. So chorea means dance. Chorea is a dance-like involuntary movement that is caused by GABA deficiency in the striatum. Hemibalismus, the name tells you, is a half ballet-like movement. It's a wide 
flinging movement of one half of the body and this typically happens when the subthalamic nucleus is damaged. The mechanism of tremor in Parkinsonism is not very clear to be very honest. So it may be due to cholinergic deficiency in the striatum or it may be due to cholinergic deficiency in other parts of the brain like brain stem. And it is seen that some abnormal electrical activity are seen in the brain stem known as gamma oscillations. They may be related with the tremor. So it's really not understandable whether with the help of the model that we discussed today, we can discuss how tremor happens. Probably we cannot explain tremor with this model. Flinging movement means swinging movement or throwing movement. And finally, we come to athetosis. Athetosis is the reading movement. Like, uh, uh, for example, when you injure a worm, the worm wriggles. It rotates and twists. So it's also a rotating and twisting movement of the hand, particularly, where you get athetosis. Again, its site of damage is not very clear. It may be due to damage to striatum and thalamus that the inhibitory control goes away and the abnormal movement starts to manifest. Out of all these movements, today we are going to discuss about the pathophysiology and management of the most common one that is Parkinsonism. When we say Parkinsonism, we don't refer to a disease, we refer to a group of diseases. Any disorder that is characterized by any of these things, any four of these things, Bradykinesia, tremor, rigidity and postural instability comes under the spectrum of Parkinsonism. For operational definition, we say that when any three out of these four are present, that can be termed as Parkinsonism. So there should be slow movement, tremor, increased tone of the muscle, ultimately resulting in unstable posture. Parkinsonism, as we have seen, happens when the dopaminergic neurons of basal ganglia are damaged. The dopaminergic neurons may be damaged by some unknown mechanism which is often genetic or by a known mechanism. When it occurs by a known mechanism, then it is known as secondary. Secondary Parkinsonism can be due to strokes where the brain is damaged, after encephalitis, due to head injury, due to copper deposition in Wilson's disease or due to drugs that inhibit dopamine action. But 95% or more of the cases of Parkinsonism that we see do not have any identifiable cause. So majority of the Parkinsonisms are idiopathic, that is of unknown or less explained cause. Idiopathic Parkinsonism is also known as Parkinson's disease. after the uh, discoverer of the condition, Sir James Parkinson. And it is only the idiopathic variety which is known as Parkinson's disease. Secondary Parkinsonism is not called Parkinson's disease. So when you use the word Parkinson's disease, be very sure that you are only referring to the idiopathic variety of the disease, not to the secondary variety of disease. Secondary causes can be called Parkinsonism, but they cannot be called Parkinson's disease. So the word Parkinson's disease always refers to idiopathic Parkinsonism. So what exactly causes this idiopathic Parkinsonism? It's a degenerative condition of the brain and the dopaminergic neurons gradually die. The disease responds to levodopa therapy and we have seen that the neurons accumulate a protein known as alpha synuclein. Let us see how this looks like and we will try to make a working model out of this. So inside the neuron there is deposition of the protein forming dense collections called Lewy bodies and these are formed of the protein called alpha synuclein. So what exactly is happening in Parkinson's disease? Let us see. So there may be genetic causes, for example mutations, in the PARC genes, there are more than 16 to 20 PARC genes identified till death or there may be other causes which we still do not know. What these causes ultimately lead to is 
generation of abnormal free radicals. These abnormal free radicals that are generated ultimately cause neuronal damage and mitochondrial dysfunction. The neuronal damage and mitochondrial dysfunction lead to generation of more free radicals. And these free radicals will cause oxidation of synaptic proteins like the protein alpha synuclein. The oxidized protein will aggregate inside the neuron. And these deposits of the oxidized protein are known as Lewy body, which are also seen in some other diseases. The Lewy bodies, by some unexplained mechanism, lead to generation of more free radicals or lead to more neuronal damage, ultimately leading to apoptosis of the neurons or death of the neuron by apoptosis. In the mitochondria, there is an enzyme known as the monoamine oxidase. In the brain, we have the isoform monoamine oxidase B. And this mau B is also involved in generation of the free radicals. Since this mechanism is a very complex mechanism, we don't have any drugs precisely to stop this. All the drugs that we have give us symptomatic relief. So, in Parkinsonism, the causes are mostly unexplained or less explained in nature. The only thing that we know is that if the Mao B enzyme can be inhibited, we can get at least less amount of free radicals and therefore the damage will be slightly less. That is why Mao B inhibitor therapy is also known as neuroprotective therapy. because it lessens the burden of free radicals. However, it doesn't really protect the neuron so much that the patient becomes healthy. It only slows down the disease process. So this is a working model of the Parkinson's disease and I hope this is clear to everyone. So as the disease progresses, the substantia Niagara it is named Niagara because of the black color, gradually becomes pale because the neurons are lost. The black color is because dopamine is oxidized to melanin-like pigments and this causes the black coloration of substantia Niagara, literally translating into black substance. The black substance becomes less black because the neurons gradually decrease in number. And as the dopamine starts decreasing in number, two things particularly happen. We have seen that dopamine and acetylcholine have opposite function in the striatum. So reduced dopamine causes an unopposed cholinergic activity. And so the features of Parkinsonism are both due to dopamine deficiency and cholinergic excess. And both of these ultimately lead to clinical features of Parkinson's disease. A Parkinsonian patient has a stooped posture. The Patient takes short steps, often freezes in between the movement with an expressionless face without any arm swing. This kind of a gait or movement is known as shuffling gait or festinant gait, which is characteristic of Parkinsonism. Clinically, Parkinsonism presents with the cardinal four features, bradykinesia, tremor, rigidity and postural instability. As time passes, patient develops other features like small handwriting or micrographia, mask faces or expressionless face, 
reduced eye blinking which is automatic movement it decreases reduced voice dysphagia because of autonomic dysfunction and freezing because the person suddenly stops the bradykinesia which means slow movement in the extreme case can become akinesia which is no movement along with this sensory nerves and autonomic nerves also get damaged so patient can develop anosmia or smelling difficulty mood disorders sleep disturbances autonomic disturbances cognitive and intellectual disturbances like problem in thinking in advanced stage patient develops a dementia which is called parkinson's dementia so the disease process cannot be halted because probably it's imprinted in the gene there is no cure for the disease till death the drugs that we use only give symptomatic relief and improve the quality of life which also is very important for the patient based on the physiology of the basal ganglia we can say that two kinds of drugs will be useful drugs that increase the dopaminergic activity and drugs that decrease the cholinergic activity now if you see the synthesis of dopamine in the brain levodopa can cross the blood brain barrier being lipid soluble dopamine cannot cross blood brain barrier the levodopa after being converted into dopamine acts on the dopamine receptor and gives relief to the patient the conversion of levodopa to dopamine is catalyzed by an enzyme called dopa decarboxylase in the periphery when the levodopa tablet is given some part of the levodopa like about 97% of it is destroyed by two enzymes the catechol o methyl transferase and the peripheral dopa decarboxylase the catechol o methyl transferase reduces the amount of levodopa so the bioavailability decreases and dopa decarboxylase not only reduces the amount of levodopa it causes dopa to convert into dopamine and noradrenaline outside the brain leading to cardiovascular side effects both these problems can be solved if we add certain groups of drugs like we can use comt inhibitors entacapone and tolcapone to prevent the degradation of levodopa we can use carbidopa to inhibit the peripheral dopa decarboxylase so that the cardiovascular side effects become less and in both the cases the availability of levodopa increases to the brain in the brain also there is comt and the monoamine oxidase b these two enzymes are constantly decreasing the amount of dopamine so we can also block these two enzymes and result in higher levels of dopamine and finally the dopamine receptor can be directly stimulated by agonist drugs like bromocriptin pargolide pramipexol and ropinirole so this is the rationale for the use of drugs in parkinsonism additionally we have two categories of drugs which are not shown here we can increase the release of dopamine from the cell and this is done by a drug called amantadine and we can reduce the excess cholinergic activity by cholinergic antagonists like benzhexol and benztropin so these together form the spectrum of the anti parkinsonian drugs i hope the basis of choosing the drug is clear we are either supplying the precursor like levodopa or we are reducing the metabolism like comt inhibitor and mau b inhibitor we are reducing adverse effects by adding carbidopa we are directly stimulating the receptor by agonists we are increasing the release of dopamine by amantadine or we are blocking excess cholinergic activity by anticholinergics so these are the physiological principles of using uh, drugs in parkinsonism so in summary the parkinsonian drugs are the substitution therapy with levodopa inhibition of adverse effect by carbidopa direct stimulation of the receptor by dopamine receptor agonist increase release of dopamine by amantadine 
inhibition of dopamine metabolism by mau b inhibitors and comt inhibitors and anticholinergic drugs to prevent cholinergic overactivity these are the six main categories of anti parkinsonian drugs out of all these drugs levodopa gives excellent benefit but as it is a degenerative process so progressively the neurons are lost and the action of the drug also decreases with time a peculiar phenomenon happens in some patients who take levodopa they will say that after taking the drug the symptoms become good and then suddenly unwanted movements start then again suddenly the movement becomes very rigid and the body cannot be moved at all this excess movement phase is called a on phase and the reduced movement phase is called off phase and this phenomenon is known as on off phenomenon that is after taking the medicine there is excessive improvement followed by excessive deterioration so two extremes are happening so what might be the reason behind this on off phenomenon we know that when levodopa as a drug is given to the patient this levodopa is converted into dopamine inside the neuron after reaching the brain the dopamine like all other neurotransmitters is then stored in synaptic vesicles and when the proper time comes when the impulse reaches then it is released outside so this whole process happens inside the neuron in the axon terminal and inside the neuron dopamine remains stored until necessary so we need neurons for storing dopamine if neurons are not there in sufficient number then dopamine can be produced by the metabolic reaction but dopamine cannot be stored properly because you need synaptic vesicles for the storage so as the disease progresses certain changes happen as the disease progresses number of neurons decrease which means the storage capacity for dopamine also decreases so whenever a dose of drug is given it is converted to dopamine and immediately released so the entire dose is immediately released as dopamine and this results in the on phase or excessive movement and after this immediate release thereafter there is no dopamine so this is followed by dopamine deficiency until the next dose and this leads to reduced movement until the next dose which is the off phase and this probably is the mechanism of the on off phenomenon is it clear to everyone so one very rational way of treating this is not to depend on the storage capacity of dopamine and that can be done if we give multiple small doses instead of one single dose so one easy way to recover from this is to fractionate the dose that is instead of giving say 100 mg levodopa thrice daily you can give 50 mg levodopa 6 times daily or 25 mg levodopa 12 times daily so you don't have to depend on the storage capacity of the neuron or 
you can give drugs that do not have to be stored. So you can use all other categories of drugs like dopamine receptor agonist. You can use drugs like the anticholinergics or virtually any other category of drug by heat and trial method. So this is on and off phenomenon which is very common in patients receiving levodopa and it can be treated in this manner. When all else is failing, the only option that we are left with is a surgical cure or a stereotactic cure. So there are some surgeries by which abnormal movement can be abolished, although they will also take away many important functions of the brain. Or we can go for the modern therapy known as the continuous dopaminergic stimulation Or we can stimulate the brain with a microchip, which is called deep brain stimulation. So whenever the patient feels rigid, the person can use a button which works by uh, signaling mechanisms, wireless signaling mechanisms, and it causes activation of the microchip inside the brain, causing stimulation of the thalamus. So these two are very advanced technologies that are available nowadays. With this idea, let us formulate a plan for treating patients with Parkinson's disease. So suppose a patient with Parkinson's disease comes to visit you. As in all diseases, one important part is non-pharmacological therapy or non-drug therapy. And this includes patient education Explain the patient about the nature of the disease. You can use caregiver education and also physical rehabilitation and physiotherapy to prevent atrophy of the muscles. Pharmacologically, all early stage diseases can receive neuroprotective therapy using Mao B inhibitors. So, selegiline or rasagiline can be used. Now, you assess the patient for functional disability. If the patient is not very disabled, continue giving rasagiline and follow up. But if the patient has severe disability, like the patient cannot move or patient cannot do day-to-day -day activities, then you choose between dopamine agonist and lipodopa. There is no rule, but usually dopamine agonist is preferred in younger patients, that is those less than 65 years of age. And levodopa is usually preferred in patients who are more than 65 years of age because levodopa causes a rapid decline in response. So it is kept as the last strategy. If the drugs alone do not give effective uh, response, you combine them in any other possible way. And when all the combination also fails, then you can do surgery or continuous dopaminergic stimulation or you can also do deep brain stimulation. So this is a functional a way of looking at Parkinson's disease and how to treat Parkinson's disease. So is it clear to everyone? So let's try the questions that we started with. Which of the following is best described as dance-like movement? Wonderful. The answer is chorea. Which of the following is characterized by resting tremor and rigidity? Yes, the answer is A, Parkinsonism. So Parkinson's disease can be Be careful while answering this. The question is tricky. The answer will be A, idiopathic. Because if it is not idiopathic, we don't call it Parkinson's disease. We will call it Parkinsonism. So Parkinsonism can be all of the above, but Parkinson's disease can only be idiopathic. 
Parkinson's disease is characterized by It is characterized by all of the above. Very good. The drug not used to treat Parkinson's disease. Yes, the answer is A, dopamine, because dopamine cannot cross blood-brain barrier as it is a polar molecule. What does carbidopa reduce? Very good. It reduces the cardiovascular side effects of levodopa. On-off phenomenon can be treated by Very good. It can be treated by all of the above. Neuroprotective therapy refers to the use of Yes, it refers to the use of the Mao B inhibitors. So I hope you understood this and uh, I hope this will be useful to understand the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease and the physiology of the basal ganglia.